So I, it, it wasn't, this wasn't too long ago I had this happen. Uh, it was actually in my house uh, when the weather turns uh, yeah. nicer, actually. there's uh, it, it, you, you, uh, I had this uh, lizard on my, uh, what you call it, my, my curtains. It's a skink. Uh, a skink? A skink, yeah. They're like a sort of a dark, uh, like a brown, black, and they have a blue tail. Very common in, in our area. Oh. Uh, so the, the little guy or gal, I think it was a guy. I think the males have the blue tails. He, he climbed up my curtains. He was just hanging there. Sometimes they live under the, they like hang out under my stove. I think they live in the shed. Mm. So I had to get a broom uh, and I, I had to knock him into like a bucket. Otherwise, you know, you just want to knock him on the ground because those suckers can run. So Quick. I had to <laughs> uh-huh. catch him in the bucket yeah. uh, and I, I took him outdoors because that's where he lives. He does not belong on my curtains. Well, maybe he was happy there. On the curtains? Yeah. He, he should have panicked to move in he first, like, though. <laughs> he looked, looked panicked to what me. What if he was seeking asylum? <laughs> we should have articulated that when he's I got the broom out. He's just a skink. He's just, he's just a skink. Don't skink shame him. <laughs> I don't know human speech. Uh, anyway, what are we talking about today? Reptilians. Oh, good. Well, I already got that started. We're not talking about skinks. Oh, it sounded like you said skanks. We're maybe talking about them though, because these reptilians. I'll tell mm-hmm. you. Well, I'm back on board then. Are skanks? Arguably, I would say that the Archons are, they're on a little bit of a a horror streak. We can slut shame here, though. We can can slut shame the Archons. Do you have an intro, or should we just do the pledge? Oh, I do have Well, what the heck are you doing? Get down to it. (laughs) Get skinky with it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Ever since the Roswell UFO incident and balloon crash in 1947, Western civilization has become obsessed with the craze that is, to quote the History Channel's world praise show, Ancient Aliens, aliens. It is world (laughs) praised. Not this world, but some world. Another world out there. Aliens. It's aliens. Greys, Nordics, little green men, and one of my favorite topics to bring up at all the dinner parties that I definitely go to. You are a dinner party goer, if ever I've seen one. I'm a debutante, if, if you are aware. Constantly um, telling me good dinner party etiquette that good I day. don't need. Pain. Yes. <laughs> Our obsession with aliens is inescapably linked to our obsession with death and the end of days. Countless movies and novels and radio shows have firmly implanted alien lore into our brains. There are some people out there... David Icke, Alex Jones, who don't think it's a coincidence, but rather a parapsychological programming by parasites from another dimension whose only goal is to end the human race through consuming our flesh, or consuming our minds, or stealing our souls, or destroying us from the inside out via the government and popular culture and watching us destroy ourselves from their shiny spacecrafts while they laugh at how selfish we are. Oh, that's all ors, so we get to keep at least one of those. You choose. <laughs> Uh, get to pick. Choose your own. <laughs> Choose your own reptilian adventure. Body, mind, soul. Which one do you want to keep? Yeah. The method is up for debate, but one ancient school of mystics once lost to history claimed to have answers over 1600 years ago and around 350 AD. In 1945, an Egyptian farmer accidentally discovered a set of Gnostic document- documents called the Nag Hammadi Codices. And these codices, the initiates of the mystery schools, described first-hand encounters with inorganic beings called archons, entities created with the birth of the solar system long before the Earth was formed. Many of the 40 documents explained in the Gnostic creation myth centered around a divine feminine called Sophia and her journey through the redemption of mankind, explaining how these inor- inorganic beings came into being. The Gnostics called them archons and even ankle biters when they were feeling spicy. But today we know them more popularly as reptilians. Do we? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so there will be Gnostic inclined listeners out there who do not know them as reptilians. Well, now you know. Okay. Those who know me know reptilian theory is very near and dear to me. We all had our weird childhoods, but the rest of you are probably sitting there wondering how in the hell Rob, devoted scholar to the pursuit of truth, PhD, allowed me to do this episode. I'm literally tied to the chair. There was nothing I could do to stop her. Absolutely nothing. 
I'm probably not going to sway any of you into becoming groupies of Ike or Jones, and I'm definitely not going to convince any of you that the entire Bush family are shape-shifting draconians and that Wi-Fi and cell phone data was given to us by the Greys through a treaty with President Eisenhower in 1954, ensuring the Greys could abduct and experiment and crossbreed with humans, and we are in the middle of an intergalactic war between the Greys and the Reptilians and the Nordics and the Pleiadians, and there are a bunch of people with alien blood sitting right next to you right now. Right, right. Right, right now, now. Right. I'm really close to you right now. But Jacob and I are also sitting astride one another. Right now. But in true Archon fashion. <laughs> Jacob can't even get a word in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he's just he's just making sounds. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's the okay, whole thing. That's it. That's, that's it. what he's got for this. Well, that's, that's as much as I can handle at this point. <laughs> In true Archon fashion, if I can plant enough reasonable doubt in your brains, I will have won this episode. Or at least convince Rob to let me do another one. Mm, all right, well, we'll see. The joy's, joy's out on that. My name is Olivia. This is Rob. Hi. hi. Right there. Hi, I'm the uh, Supreme Hierophant. What, what are you again? I'm the Grandmaster. Grandmaster of the Order. Go on. And these are the alchemical actors. Yeah, who do we got? Specifically, Savannah Verrett. Hello, everyone. What's up, Savannah? And Jacob Wheatley. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> Yo. This is a cult confessions. We, the, we members the members of the, the secret, secret order of alchemical, alchemical actors do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. This is, a, this is what we're calling a flip. We flip, flip that mic. Mic flip. We mic flip. <laughs> I have, what, it was like spin the bottle, but you just spun it on the table and flipped it over. It's and more the, like flip cup. Oh. Olivia's got it. She's she done been flipped. Or I've been flipped. Flip. We've been flipped. Flip flop. It's like Freaky Friday. <gasps> oh. <laughs> Not at all. Wait, I want to be Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> if you're listening, uh, Olivia, you should be doing this stuff. Uh, you got to you gotta rate, rate, and, rate and subscribe. Rate and subscribe. Rate and subscribe. Click that subscribe button and uh, be sure that you are, are get, feeding us those stars. They keep us going, those black hearts out there on the interwebs and what <laughs> have you. Yeah, so uh, we, live by, we live by the rate and subscribe and uh, consider giving to us on that, on that Patreon. I feed off of black hearts. I feed off of Patreon. So do, too. do a little of each if you can, if you can, if you can swing it. That's not bad. No, that's good. <laughs> what? I, I feel Jake scared. Making <laughs> oh. a face at me. Yeah, he, that's what he does. Don't let it, <laughs> don't let it throw you now that you're, you're in charge of that mic there. All right. So Olivia, uh, what's going on here? We got Gnostics. We got reptilians. We got Egyptian farmers. Yeah. So as far as sources go today, guys, um, we're we're in some uncharted territory, and by that I mean it's been charted by a bunch of other people, and this kind of <laughs> but not is, us. It's like a, it's all of it together. So right. it's going to be a little convoluted. Um, the main website that I used for a lot of my research is called Biblioteca Pleiades. Um, yeah, the cons- that's a conspiracy website. Yeah, yeah, it's as sketchy as it sounds, mm-hmm. but very informative. <laughs> um, and then I also used a lot of David Icke books for this. Um, How many are we talking? Uh, what, what does your bookshelf look like? So I actually have a David Icke book, and I can't think of what it's called, but it's like a combination of every single one of his theories oh, like, yeah. in a book. And it's it's like... I have that for The Hitchhiker's huge. Guide to the Universe. It's probably as, <laughs> as large. There's like six of those, I think, and I've yeah. got them all in one book. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot, um, but it's like a bunch of his other books kind of combined into one, but simplified a little bit. Um, but we can post the book that I have. I just can't think of what it is off the top of my head. All right. Um, but those are the two sources that I used the most. And then also, uh, actually, the Nag Hammadi codices, actually looking them up and reading them and sifting through them and interpreting them for you all. Fascinating, because I do not do the Gnostic thing, so that's yeah. cool. Thanks so, for doing that. warning, pronunciations, I tried very, very hard. Yeah, as is traditional. Yes, and also, <laughs> some of this stuff... Maybe you're a Gnostic pro, and you might catch me and realize I misinterpreted something. But bear with me, because this is all basically from me interpreting. 
text. Delightful. That's very old. <laughs> so. Delightful. Interpret away. Okay. Now I know you're all asking. I know that you are all asking. Olivia, what's a reptilian? Uh, Olivia, what's a reptilian? What's an archon? It was polite of you what to wait to archon? ask that. Yeah, who, cares? Oh, who cares? Oh, who cares? I wasn't going to ask I can't that. Answer that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Just kidding. I like David Icke. Well, to a point. I like his turquoise yeah. suits. But well, you wouldn't take him on a date. <laughs> no. no. Not in that turquoise suit. <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> well, I'm here to answer at least two of those questions, give okay. or take. The word archon was first used in ancient Greece to refer to any religious or governmental authority. The Gnostics picked it up later, which is where its more modern definition that we're going to talk about today kind of hails from via the discovery of the Nag Hammadi codices. Many Gnostic texts refer to the Archons as the authorities, which sounds kind of like a cool 90s German underground punk band, but for the Gnostics, it was terrifying. Even in modern conspiracy circles, many people won't call them Archons, claiming that using their real name and acknowledging their power as leader over you only adds to their strength. This is where nicknames like ankle biters comes in that I mentioned earlier. To really understand what an archon is, we got to go right to the Gnostics. We're going to jump in the time machine. Oh, boy. <laughs> back Ooh. to the Gnostics. So we're back to like, what did you say, the year 350? Yeah. 80. Good year. Yeah. Good year. <laughs> it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was wearing sandals, I think. Yeah. We should get back well, to that. Yep. Probably not the, uh, you know, the Vikings. They probably weren't wearing sandals. They were, they were in kilts? Boots. boots. Oh, I, I would wear boots because all that snow and also the sea monsters. Well, before we can Bite like your toes off. take it to <laughs> like <your> toes. <laughs> the Gnostics, we got to take it to the, to the creation okay. of the Gnostics and everyone else. The Gnostic story of creation centers around the truly badass Aeon Sophia the embodiment of God's wisdom and represents Earth in our realm before it truly was. So this idea of Sophia is as much of an entity as it is an idea. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so Sophia is a kind of spirit, spiritual entity. So she is like a physical thing, but she's more so like literally if God were to like take his wisdom off of him and create another entity for it, she is that entity. Okay, got it. So she is as much of a thought as she is a thing. Does that make sense? So she's both of? the thought of God and of God's essence. Because you have to think the Gnostics are, they're all about the pursuit of knowledge. That's thats their thing. So, so they're pursuing her. Uh, Getting to know her? No. Meeting her? Taking her out for drinks? No, nah, not really. No, right. no. <laughs> Want your diner? <laughs> The Gnostics <laughs> attempt to answer the theodicy of why God made life so difficult with, well, something must have happened to make everything go to shit, right? Chaos doesn't just manifest. Something must have caused it in the beginning. Or God is just really a complicated guy. You know, I think we all are. Really. Yeah. yeah. Deep down, <laughs> you know, we got our good Nobody's and our bad. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. For the Gnostics, knowledge was power, and all physical matter is just a distraction from that higher pursuit of knowledge. This kind of, like, you know, we hear about this a little bit with, like, Blavatsky, too, and the different um Right, the, the tears, tears of being, yeah. But, yeah. you know, there's no good or bad, right? God is just an, em we are an emanation of God, and then we're slowly yeah. climbing our way back up to God. And the material world being, like, this distraction from... Uh, yes, but the material world is spiritualizing. So Blavatsky is not, it's not like the material world is bad, I thought it on some in some of the races it was like that the material world world was just it's just of a lower level of evolution. Oh. So that it's all evolving. So theoretically, the higher beings will pull us up to enlightenment. Eventually, we're all going to go back to God. Essentially, Sophia was born from the likeness of Pistis, who basically functions like the Titans from Greek mythology, but way more hands off. That's the best way that I can kind of put this idea of pistis into your head is like literally like the titans remember in hercules like <laughs> yeah. trapped under the ground like that's like she's like that kind of but you know not really the eternal not realm angsty or what more like literally more hands-off like okay. the titans became hands-off like when they had to be <laughs> like right. when like zeus was like but she never no, made bye. any attempt <laughs> but she like you're, you'll find is like like sit like continue the story like pistis really like she 
she kind of pieces out. Like she pieces in and out. Like, <laughs> Pieces. Okay. She's very like hands off. Like she cares, but then she's like, mm, you got to figure it out. But she doesn't say that. Fair enough. <laughs> the eternal realm of truth is filled with this immeasurable light is what they call it. That first created the immortal aeons, permitting no shadows to enter. But outside looking in through the windows was a shadow called darkness waiting. Out from this darkness, chaos was born, producing offspring from its depths with a mind of its own. But the text makes sure to mention that the shadow was subsequent to the light that existed in the beginning. The darkness was born from the abyss, which comes directly from Pistis. Wrath and envy are born from the chaos, inflicting the earth and in turn creating matter. So, Savannah, I'm excuse like, me. I... So, it's this idea that... So the the darkness and the shadow is just as is equal to the light in that the darkness was born from the same abyss that Pistis herself was born from. So the darkness is literally a part of her. Okay. It's the same kind of idea as like I think you have to have good and evil is where it kind of balance. Yeah, they don't really say that and that's not really their like MO, but that's kind of what I gathered from it is like she continuously doesn't do anything about the darkness because it it is part of her. Like it comes from her. It it's not all darkness even though it is chaos and darkness. Okay, so there is evil, there is good, and they're both coming from the same place. They don't really say evil and good, though. It's more of light and darkness light and is dark. what they say. Okay. But we don't want to be dark. We want to be light. Well, the darkness is a thing. Yeah. It's a being. We want to avoid that. Yeah, because the darkness created chaos. So we want to tend toward the light. Go toward the light. Yes. Matter did not come out of chaos, but it was in chaos, existing as a part of it. When Pistis is inevitably face-to-face with the matter of chaos, a dark pool of boundless darkness and unfathomable depth, she becomes disturbed. The matter had no spirit to it, yet the disturbance comes after her, causing her bre- to breathe in his face so hard that he went crawling back into the abyss. Weird flex, Pistis. So she literally, the darkness comes for her, and she blows back into his face and sends him back into the abyss. Oh. And then she does that and dips. She just leaves. <laughs> but where does she go? She uh, We'll get into that, okay. but she goes basically to her plane of heaven for a lack of a better term if that makes sense we'll get into it you know sophia essentially wishes a ruler god into being rising out of the water the the pool of like watery darkness wait who's sophia sophia's uh, pistis sophia is the thought of god the god's wisdom figure okay so but pistis is a different character yes okay if like pistis is a titan Sophia's like Athena the, or something. Oh. I was supposed to say, like oh. the gods. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. But not. Like, don't get too caught up on the, especially to our listeners. I am not saying that anything to do with Gnosticism is a like Greek or Roman <laughs> mythology. I'm just trying to use it to kind of frame a better reference gotcha. for you. And this gotcha. is how David Icke would be thinking about it, right? Your, your perspective will more or less match the way David Icke is interpreting Gnosticism. Ike is a little hands-off about Gnosticism. Oh, okay. So you're trying to pull these things together. <laughs> yeah. So okay. this is like, Ike is going to come take the whole reptilian theory, and this is where he got it. Like, don't get me wrong. But he's, the history of it, like the Nag Hammadi codices, he might mention, but he's not going to, like, give it the same, like, historical, like, this is the Gnostics. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sophia essentially wishes a ruler god into being, rising out of the water, and it literally says, this is a quote, lion-like in appearance, androgynous, with great authority within himself, but ignorant of whence he came into being. The creature hears Sophia say to him, youth, pass over here, and decides to name himself Yaldabaoth, his other title, the Demiurge. So, uh, to explain that quote for a second, she, or the ruler god that came out of the the water basically the depths of the darkness um literally besides being androgynous um doesn't understand where he came from and that becomes very important he doesn't understand that pistis is like the the reason he's alive basically doesn't understand that um sophia's cool with him with yaldabaoth they're fine they're vibing 
But she's not down with his appearance as she kind of just sticks him on a throne surrounded by clouds so no one but the Holy Spirit could see him and peaced out to the heavens herself. Mm-hmm. So her and, you know, Sophia and Pistis, they kind of, you know, they helped to make this ruler God and he didn't really understand where he came from and then they kind of just left. Wow. <laughs> and that's why things are going to become problematic later. <laughs> Yadabayoth is kind of a prick. Or, <laughs> yeah, <put> lightly. <laughs> yeah, or has um an only child god complex that's really, really out of check. He was never really parented, and he can only hear Sophia's voice instead of actually seeing her likeness. So he didn't have any real concept of Pistis and or Sophia, and became self obsessed instead, claiming to be the first figure made from light. He could not see anything but his own greatness, staring into his own watery depths, a lot like Narcissus, you know. He separates this to create a watery heaven for himself and an apparently dry earth for us, which he kindly calls his footstool. (laughs) We are his footstool. (laughs) What does a young god do after he's made himself a kingdom? Speak some immortal sons into being. He has three sons, which I will butcher the names of. Bob... Yeah. Greg and Marty. <laughs> you got them. You got them. <laughs> Yayo, Eloi, and Estefeos. Eloi, like uh, Elohim? I think. Uh, In that direction? I think. Is, yeah. uh, My son is born. I must coo to awaken him. Coo. Coo, coo, coo. Coo. Yeah. Ooh, then his name will be Yao. I must coo to awaken the next. Eh. Then his name will be Alawi. And the last. Coo, 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 choo. Us. Ah, then his name will be Astaphius. By the way, I made you all androgynous so I could give you two names. Welcome to being an inorganic being. These are the three sons of the father. These three sons mix with four other entities grown from the darkness to create the seven heavens of chaos, which would be a pretty sick gang name. <laughs> I'm pretty certain that this is kind of equivalent to the arch an- like the archangels in Christianity. I mean, God made the angels too. So the sons, the three sons plus the four, those are the archangels. I, th- I think like they never say this explicitly, but this is what I interpreted. So is, we can think of them as Gabriel, Michael, rather than Bob and Marty. Yeah, oh, not those sons. Oh. Those are, so the three mixed with four oh, other okay, sons. okay, okay. So the four that come out of those three. So there's the three sons, and then there's yeah. four other sons that come out of the darkness. Those oh. three sons and those four sons bang it out, and then they create these other. And that's the archangels. Yes. Okay. They never call them that. I'm just comparing them to the archangels. Okay, so the, the, so the three and the four are like the higher elements of light and darkness battling it out. Don't get too caught up on these people yet because uh, okay. we're <laughs> we're not even. Okay, so the, but the darkness spun off four, and and the god spun off three, right? No, the three suns are the three suns. Yeah, but the four came out of the darkness. Yeah, the same place. So there's the four three. and three on yeah. opposite teams. Why they split it up like that, I have no idea. All right. If that's what you're getting at, I don't know why they say, here are the three sons, and then here are four other entities. I'm not sure if like the entities aren't like the same. Maybe they're more like, they're less human is maybe the, because base. so. So they're all coming out of the darkness. Yeah. Okay. And everything is like a hermaphrodite, so... Well, that's easy. Yeah. All right. But anyway, so... But th- this is like where we see the idea of seven gods and seven days of the week in Norse and Roman mythology as well, is this seven is coming up again a lot. Neat. 
Um, each son slash daughter slash androgynous being got its own realm, which Yaldabaoth tricked out. Or, <laughs> tricked out? Tricked, tricked out the, the crib? That's yes. sick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tricked out his bride. <laughs> each son slash daughter slash androgynous being got its own realm, which Yaldabaoth tricked out MTV Welcome to My Crib style oh. with countless myriads and everything you could want in your heavenly kingdom, all the way up to the sixth <laughs> realm, Sophia's territory. Basically, Yaldabaoth destroys everything below the six heavens, and Sophia sees he's coming for her mansion and is like, oh, hell no. At some point, Pistis comes in and steps in and does her thing and blows him away for a while to Teratos, which is not a cool place to be if you know mythology. I'm pretty sure that's where the labyrinth with Tartarus. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's that whole scenario. Oh, yeah, the Greek, so we're mm -hmm. some Greek yeah. mythology now. Mm. This is when Yaldabaoth's ego is going to really start to hurt him. He starts to go around peacocking, saying, I do not need anything. I am God, and there is no other God but me. Needless to say, the immortals did not like that, including Pistis. She calls him Samael, I think. Samael. Samael, yeah. So, yeah. Or Blind God, telling him that he is very wrong. <laughs> An enlightened immortal human exists before you and will appear within your fashioned bodies. The human will trample upon you as potter's clay is trampled, and you will go with those who are yours down to your mother, the abyss. For in the consummation of your works, all of the deficiency that appeared in the truth will be dissolved. It will cease, and it will be like something that never existed. Slam dunk, man. Unfortunately, right after she said this, she sees herself in the reflection of the water and bounces right back up to the light. I think what? she she literally it says like she was startled like she sees her reflection and she just like pieced it, out again. It happens to the best of us. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's how Jacob gets in the bath every day. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just jump straight in. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Looks in the mirror, jumps in the bath, <laughs> hides. <laughs> One of Yadabeoth's sons, Sabaoth, hears Pistis's voice. He worships her, unlike his father. He glorified her because she informed them of an immortal human and the light of the human. Then Pista Sophia stretched forth her finger and poured upon him light from her light for a condemnation of his father. When Sabaoth received light, he received great authority against all the powers of chaos. And since that day, he has been called the Lord of the Powers. He hated his father, the darkness, and his mother, the abyss. He loathed his sister, the thought of the chief creator, the one who moves to and fro over the water. Sabaoth basically has two children named Israel and Jesus Christ with Sophia's oh. daughter, Zoe. But we don't have time to unpack that because... <laughs> Zoe's like this cute little <laughs> 90s chick, right? She yeah. wears a... Why they named her Zoe, like, I do shirt, not understand. Yeah. I, I have no idea. <laughs> little belly shirt. She's got... <laughs> Uh, she's Pony like tail. <laughs> <laughs> Zoe. <laughs> yep. Yep. Good old Zoe. Yelda Bayoth gets super mad at his son when he finds out that Sophia whisked him away to his own heaven and made him more powerful than anything else in the chaos, and out of that anger he created death. Rob, have you ever been so mad at your kid that you wanted to create death? No. Good answer. <laughs> And of course, death was androgynous, so it mated with itself to create basically everything bad ever in this world. The males are listed as envy, wrath, weeping, sighing, mourning, lamenting, tearful, groaning. Mourning and lamenting. <laughs> and tearful, tearful groaning. Tearful groaning. <laughs> all, different, all different guys. Sighing, weeping, yes. The females, wrath, grief, lust, sighing, cursing, bitterness, and quarrelsomeness. Uh, sighing is on both fronts, oh, two I guess. Sighs, two yeah, sighing, with male size and female size. Sigh. Everyone knows those are different. It's a deeper yeah. message, yeah. The oh, vaginal no. sigh is different than the oh, penal oh, size. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're androgynous. <laughs> Are you gonna say? I was just gonna say. I love how the women get uh, lust yeah. out of theirs. Well, you That's traditionally great. would, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do any of these sound familiar? Any of these words? Sigh. Yeah. I sigh occasionally. Well, Jacob know... sighs a lot. I do. Yes, I was about to Savannah say. Knows Penal size. I, I know. I don't think <laughs> you do. Oh, no. I know the meaning of every single word that you just said to me. A lot of these sound like the the seven deadly sins. Oh. Oh. That's where you're going. Yeah. Oh. 
Yes. Oh, wait. Some of them are directly yes. the sins, but then a lot of the others. And there's also seven, I believe, in each category. So, hmm. again, seven coming up. But That know. crying one's not one of them. There's no. eight it's in the, the eight. They just, It's <laughs> the extra. Well. Cousin. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> Tearful groaning makes it eight. Tearful groaning. Always Come throwing on. it off. Tearful groaning. <laughs> well, all of these children, all those children that I just named, those are all children. Yep. They all mated and had seven kids each, making 49 androgynous demons, all found in the Book of Solomon. Ah, oh. yeah. Well, I was going to say, are you going to name them? <laughs> all yes, 49. Go. <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> and Crowley would invite him to his house in Scotland. Yadabayath eventually <laughs> finally realizes Pistis' reflection in the waters and has an immediate FML moment when he realizes he's been talking mad shit this whole time. Skipping ahead a little to avoid confusion. Trust me, I'm avoiding confusion by skipping ahead. Skipping ahead to a, a little to avoid confusion. A figure named Adam of Light appears to Yadabayath, subsequently freaking him the hell out. <laughs> Meanwhile, two figures named Psyche and Eros, these might be familiar names if you're into mythology, they bang and create a sprout from the ground that makes other people want to bang. They make life, but not human life. Now, I want to make it clear for a moment that when the text refers to the authorities, we can sub that word out for Archon and it's going to mean the same thing because I'm going to end up saying that a lot. Are these the authorities, these uh, products of Eros and Psyche banging? Uh, Not almost. Getting there. We're almost there. Getting there. We've well, fallen a far the Archons distance. are already <laughs> around. So the Archons oh, okay. are technically all the suns. Oh, way, way, back, the, way up at the top. From the beginning. Yeah. Well, that's where they stemmed from. The and seven. Then, the three plus four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the three plus four. We have <laughs> to do some math here. It's really well, weird are. that they did. <laughs> it's not the seven. It's the three plus four. <laughs> Before Adam of Light went back up to the light in true peace fashion, the authorities were all... This, this dude, dude messed oh my up God. So, so, so many, many heavens. heavens. Oh like, my you have God. no idea. He undid all of our hard work. All of it. It, it And all he it. didn't do anything. Nothing. Nothing. So, so that's what they said, those guys? Yeah, that's that's exactly what the Nag Hammadi said. The Nag Hammadi. Who are the, <laughs> the Archons? Nag. Those are what, yeah, the Archons are the authorities. Sweet. Found them. But. <laughs> Good job. Adam of Light <laughs> being, well, a figure of light answered yes but if you wish that he not be able to ruin our work come let's create a human being from the earth according to the image of our body and according to the likeness of this being to serve us so that whenever this being sees his likeness he may become enamored of it then he will no longer ruin our work but we shall make those who are born from the light our servants through all the time of this age hopefully you're starting to see where this is going the authorities gained the knowledge to create people, but somewhere in the, I think, eighth heavens, Sabayat's partner Zoe, also an aspect of Sophia, had other plans. Right, because she had to catch my so-called life, which was on later that night. <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> she anticipated the Archon's plan, creating a human being first in order to teach mankind how to retaliate against them. Oh. Yes. Y'all make fun of Zoe, but she's about to... She's about to do some stuff. Well, she's heard Nirvana, so... Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> she's not messing around with the Foo Fighters. She's going straight to the source. You keep going, Rob. How long can we draw that out? I can, I can go on for a while. <laughs> Sophia let a single drop of light fall from her heavens, floating on the water. From this drop of light, a human immediately appeared, androgynous. For 12 months, Sophia molded that first drop into the female body in the likeness of her mother. This is where the hermaphrodite came from, but also Eve, the instructor of life, is what they call her in the Gnostic text. The authorities called her offspring the Beast to keep people from the truth. Ooh, I've heard of that. I am part of my mother, and I am the mother. I am the wife. I am the virgin. I am pregnant. I am the midwife. I am the one who comforts during labor pains. My husband produced me and I am his mother, and he is my father and my lord. He is my potency. What he desires, he speaks with reason. I am becoming, but I have borne a lordly man. 
Meanwhile, the cosmic rulers mold Adam by each of them casting their seed into the midst of the navel of the earth. The navel of the earth. <laughs> the just, earth navel. Just, earth belly button. Just marinate on that. Yaldabaoth didn't want Adam to have a soul and wanted to keep him as a lifeless vessel to control him better. So he left Adam alone for 40 days, 40 days without a soul. Mm, I've heard of that number. <laughs> On the last day, Zoe came to him, breathing life towards him, but this only made Adam crawl around a little, basically like a worm. They describe him as a worm man. There's a lot of breathing going on. <laughs> they do breathe a lot. <laughs> the worm thing is new, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the authorities, or the archons, did not like that at all and seized Adam, throwing him in paradise and going back up to the heavens. But Zoe took pity on him, sending Eve down to instruct him. And when Eve saw Adam lifeless on the ground, she immediately took pity on him. Adam? Adam? Adam, wake up, hon. Oh my god. You gave me life. You're going to be called the mother of the living now. Are you comparing me to your mom already? Now when the authorities found out about Adam having a new soul, they were again not happy. They sent seven archangels to deal with the mess. When they laid eyes on Eve speaking to Adam, they were outraged. Now, here's where things get kind of fucked up. And by kind of, I mean they get fucked up. The authorities seize Eve, raping her with the intent of polluting her light that sh so she could no longer ascend back to the heavens. They knock out Adam, planning to tell him that Eve actually came from his rib, causing him to rule over her. Sound familiar? <gasps> oh my gosh. But... Eve was a powerful woman of light and was not about to let those authorities ruin her work on Adam. She tricks the authorities into believing she has become one with the tree of knowledge and they flee in fear. Oh no! Ah, it's a tree! Oh not God. the tree! It's so strong and ah, tree-based! It's plant-based! It scares me! Oh, oh no! Now, part of Eve's trick required her to leave almost a clone of her likeness with Adam and the authorities. When the authorities came back from their defeat, they decided to punish Eve's likeness, thinking it was her. It was the likeness that the authorities and the angels defiled in every way. First, Eve conceived Abel from the first ruler, and she bore the rest of his sons from the seven authorities and their angels. Now all this came to pass according to the forethought of the chief creator, so that his mother might bear within herself every seed mixed and joined together with the fate of the world and its configurations and justice. A plan came into being because of Eve, so that the fashioned bodies of the authorities might become the fences for the light. Then the light will condemn them through their fashioned bodies. As much as I'd love to continue on the origin of the world, we would be here for another six hours. Eventually, the Gnostics came along and essentially fight the good fight against the Archons as desired by Sophia so many pages ago. But I think you get where I'm coming from when I talk about the Archons now. So the Gnostics are fighting for the Archons against knowledge? Say that again? You said they came. the Gnostics came to fight for the Archons. Against the Archons. Oh, they're fighting against the Archons. Yeah, because okay. the Gnostics are the technically the... That the, makes sense. They're the... So they want the, the slave knowledge. people. They are all about knowledge. Yeah. Get me that knowledge mm -hmm. that's hidden in that tree there. Give it to me. That's what scares them. Scares off the uh, other guys. Right. That's, yeah. 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 Archons. Yeah. So now that we have like a background on what an Archon is, you know... And how. And how. The Gnostics uh, identified two types of archons, basically. A neonate or embryonic type, or a draconian or reptilian type. The Gnostics, needing to make things complicated, categorized archons into three levels of archon. And I'm going to give you a very brief version of each. <laughs> so there's level one, which is like the cosmological version of an archon, or level, if you want. A base definition. Archons are inorganic beings that appeared before the creation of the solar system as we know it, emanating from a home planet called Pl Plior Plior Pleroma? Pleroma is, I think. That looks right. It's the realm of the Pleorama. cosmic gods. No, there's no, it's Pleroma. Yeah, Pleorama like, sounds like fun though. Like you could skate like there. Futurama. Yeah, it does. Like yeah, like fun. There's a disco. Put on going your roller on. skates. Yeah, yeah and they're mm. discoing. <laughs> 
It's before Zoe was born. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> she wouldn't have been into it, but <laughs> no, it's no, some some disco stuff. Mm-hmm. These archons lack intentionality and hate us for possessing it ourselves, often causing them to intrude on our boundaries. So to take it an- another step deeper, there's level two, which is more of like the psychological archon. A more scientific view from the mystery schools, archons are an alien force that subliminally controls our mind and causes us to stray away from our own intentionality. Basically, psycho-spiritual parasites that feed into our bad tendencies in extreme and violent ways. But I think it's important to remember, they're also offspring of Sophia making us some kind of cosmic kin. Food for thought. Not reptilian food for thought. Friends. Not food. Archons exist both somewhere and in our minds at the same time. They can literally penetrate our biosphere or less risky, just mind influence us from embryonic form to sway us from evolving properly as species. So they're just everywhere. You can't escape them. Yes. For a little Gnostic hot take real fast, uh, Judeo-Christian salvationism is the primary ploy of the Archons, an alien implant. Judeo-Christian uh-huh. salvationism, meaning yeah. the the Judeo-Christian salvationism, that we will be saved but, through belief in God? Yeah. What, what do you take that to mean, Jacob? Judeo-Christian salvationism, because it's so different from I was, group to group. Uh, I was about to say, because kind of both of them kind of think different things. I think um, she links them together. Oh. Or not she, but the text that I was reading. Because you're Protestant concept is that you just believe in Jesus and you're good. Yes? Yeah. Catholics, you have to do works to be you, as yeah, a manifestation yeah. of belief. And then Jews, I don't actually have a clear line on. They, they're they not really... I mean, like, with the whole, like, Jesus thing, they don't really think of him as the... the right, he would not be involved at all no, in no. their personal so salvation. That's what kind of confused me. Well, that's, I think, the reason... They put them together because it's, I think it's supposed to be like salvationism oh, in both? at all. Oh, okay. I think it's the idea. I think that's them highlighting. Yeah. Uh, by putting it together, I think that's, y- yeah. Okay. Like, it, that any kind of salvationism is a ploy, like from the church. Mm-hmm. And then there's level three, which is the sociological level of Archon. And this is where I think most people are going to be familiar with like reptilian in modern Western culture. Uh, When looking at human society, archons are aliens who force their way into our authoritarian systems, including religious beliefs. And I I would say probably heavily like relying on religious beliefs in order to turn us against our potential and away from our once symbiotic relationship with Gaia. Gaia being, you know, like mother nature, mother earth, if you want. They're more like agents of error versus evil in that they only piggyback off of what's already existing within our brains. They're not going to create some kind of new problem. They're going to take what's already bad about us and distort it and use it to their advantage. I think that this has to be part of the reason that the Gnostics were less a group with a hierarchy and more so a bunch of mystery schools dedicated to Gnosticism and defeating the Archons, if Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So that's where... I'm going to stop the research today because that's a lot to unpack. <laughs> so we'll view this as a part one. Yeah. How reptilians are like archons. Well, are they archons. are. How archons are reptilians. But archons came first. Uh, Question mark. Well, so the archon idea came first, but all along David Icke would be saying, these people you've been describing, these They're archons the are the reptilians. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Did, wait, that wasn't clear. No, sure. Well, it's a nice yeah. way to yeah. round yeah. things yeah. out, isn't it? This shit is crazy. I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm having trouble wrapping my. I mean, like, I'm kind of getting it, but it's also, I don't understand the point of. But I guess there isn't one. So the, the archons are trying to hold back knowledge from us. They don't want us to know things. They're trying to control us and eat us. And this so, is the reptilians. Oh. But they're the same thing. Okay, right. yeah. So it's like how the reptilians are kind of like the overlords or whatever, and they're controlling everything. They are the archons are do. They're the same thing. I think the most important, like important part of the like Gnostic creation story uh-huh. is the part where they they talk about how you know they created like or with Adam of Light 
you know, they took this idea of atom of light and they made Adam this, you know, from the mud. They created this man that they were like, you are going to be the prototype for our enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And through having this enslaved people, which actually Adam of light gave them the idea, which is also the ironic part. Mm -hmm. But through like having these enslaved people, basically the Archons would never be able to be stopped. Because Sabaoth was over there trying to change things. Yadabaoth had things a certain way and was very in denial of Pistis and the light and yada, yada, yada. Sabaoth took a step back from his dad and was like, no, mm-hmm. like, let's go back to Pistis. Like, she's got it going on. So it's like, and Sabaoth is, you could look at him and more as like a Jesus type, but like, I wouldn't say that because there is other people named Jesus Christ in in Gnosticism. So. Oh. Like Zoe's, you know, Zoe had the two sons with Sabaoth, Israel, and Jesus Christ. So it's kind of like, I think that's metaphorical. But, right. You know. That makes sense. Did that answer any of that? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You guys have other questions? So, like, we would have been basically like soulless, mindless dummies for these people. Yeah. But Zoe stepped in and was like, no, actually, let yeah. me how, because and, I like them or like well, I feel bad for them. Yeah. And, you know, Zoe is literally an aspect of her mother, Sophia. Okay. So she carries that, like, you know, that wisdom, the God's wisdom and, the, and that, you know, feeling. But I think Zoe also, she just took pity on what was happening, but also understood like, oh, the Archons are they're trying to ruin everything for mm-hmm. everyone. Mm. And that's why she created Eve with the help of her mom so that Eve could be literally, like, literally they call her, like, you know, like she is the, the whatever they call her, the instructor of life. Literally, she instructs life into Adam. Oh, okay. Because Adam was this soulless worm <laughs> being. Like, they literally describe him just writhing around in the mud. Ew. Like, it's as a worm. And Eve literally, she picks him up and she gives him a soul and gives him a purpose. So, like, I don't know. I think there is a lot of things that you can take away from, like, the whole story without believing it, if that makes sense. So, like, David Icke actually believes that this happened? So... (laughs) Replacing Archon with Reptilian. And so there's, like, an interplanetary aspect to this. He's sort of turning all this stuff into aliens, So it's not really, like, heavens. It's, like, aliens came from different planets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And created us. Because those, those, some of those folks were on a planet, I remember. He takes the, he takes the God Christianity aspect kind of out of it. Okay. But, so he still recognizes, like, Gnosticism, but it's, it's different. It's a different, it's not a religious tone. He did the same thing that the uh, Raelians did with the Christian Bible. He took the Gnostic texts and turned them into alien texts. Yeah. Sort of literalized yeah. them into a physical form, technologized them. Hmm. So he takes a lot of like, like he even uses the word archon a lot in his books. But when he's talking about archon, he's talking about that third level, that sociological level. That's that like, that most of us are aware of that this idea of the reptilian overlords taking over that's more of like his his thing so we'll call this like an introduction to reptilians yep and uh, you're going to come back and give us more on reptilians at some point yeah we're going to come back and get into ike and how he took all this and came up with wearing turquoise for two years. Heck yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I think he just really liked the color and wanted an I excuse to wear it all the time. Mm, it'd be nice. It'd be nice if I could just make my favorite color just like a magic thing, right? You just write thousands of pages about it. But I mean, we'll talk about it, but David Icke, he was a very... He had a lot to lose. Like, he wasn't like a conspiracy guy on the internet mm-hmm. who didn't have anything to lose. Like he was a man that was a huge British figure that had everything to lose. So <laughs> he must have believed in this enough. <laughs> it's one of the bigger British people. They're they're not a large people as a rule. <laughs> I was about to say. God damn it! <laughs> it's a it's a small place. He's popular. <laughs> he occupied more of it than others. Oh my god! <laughs> I hereby adjourn. And declare close this meeting of the secret order of alchemical actors until such a time as we get together and do it again. Yeah. That's all I have to say about that. Mm-hmm. Olivia, who do we have joining us uh, all around the table? Do we have, we had some voices. Oh my god. Can you remember who did those? <laughs> so who did the voices for your episode then? 
We still don't know their last names. Okay, just Dan name. Dan Rosen. It's Dan Rosendale, yeah. Rosendale, okay. Brooke Mayoral. Yeah, Brooke. Hunter. Hunter Sheeler. John Cook. James Caplanges. Lucy Bond. Such a crew. Brianna Literal. Very big crew today. I think that's all of them. Yeah, well, that was a lot of voices. A lot of voices. Uh, (laughs) Thanks to those folks. Excellent work, as usual, alchemical actors. Uh, Sitting around the table here, Olivia, who do we have? Savannah Verrett. Goodbye, everyone. J not James. Oh my, my name god. Is Jacob. Oh my god, Jacob Wheatley. <laughs> Ouch. I'm so brain She's dead. She's at the end of her rope here. Right. She's falling apart. It's not the first time that's happened. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, who am I? Rob C. Thompson, PhD. Very good. <laughs> that's your name. That's my official guess. <laughs> His contact It's on the birth phone. certificate. Yeah. That's <laughs> how my mother named me. She had very high expectations. Uh, well done. Way, way to go. I, I didn't really have a choice. Yeah. Uh, and and who are you? I'm Olivia Literal, your grandmaster. I want you to uh, thank you, thank you all for a wonderful year of podcasting. This is the end of our fourth series on uh, black magic. And uh, we're going to be heading into our Blavatsky series when you come back with us. Uh, that would be season five. Uh, so thank you all for listening to us. Uh, we do record at the uh, beautiful Cadby Theater on Maryland's scenic eastern shore uh, in Y Mills. Uh, so uh, I did here at Chesapeake College. Do I say that? Sometimes I say that. I should say that. Mm-hmm. Here at Chesapeake the College. Full address. <laughs> no, <One>? oh. <laughs> people. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, it's, like they can find us. Let's just so. Google it. <laughs> well, that's something we should all bear in mind. Um, <sighs> we trust you, confessors, to <laughs> to keep us from being murdered by anyone who might be inclined to. I didn't realize that part was going to be included. In the <laughs> we are defended by a cornfield. You will have to try very hard. Our defense is a <laughs> yeah, but at the time, to- this is the winter, so they can't find no, us. You're not going to be able to get to us. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. Thanks for thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time for our Blavatsky series. Bye guys.